Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle this beautiful but warm Sunday morning. I am Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you. I trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting. May you be receptive to the voice of the Blessed Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we ask you to accept our humble adoration this morning. Our humble thanks, Lord. And Father, we thank you today for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the honor of knowing you, of having a personal love-based relationship with you. And we pray today, Father, even as we gather around your throne this morning in worship and in prayer, and now, oh Lord, to listen to your word, we pray, O oh Lord, that the Holy Spirit will speak to us will illuminate our minds to understand the deep things that you want us to know today. Help us to understand your word, Lord, not as man expounds it, but as God intended it. We pray this in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Once more, good morning and God bless you and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. Our scripture reading today is taken from the book of Luke chapter 2. And I'm reading verses 7 to 12. And yes, it's not Christmas Day, but uh, I would still like to go over a sermon that I wanted to speak to you about. And it's entitled, No Room, No Room. And reading from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 7 to 12. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for, I be, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is, this, is, is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Praise God. Praise God. I'm not going to keep you very long. I just want to talk about no room for Jesus. When we read this story, we realize that Christmas is the most amazing gift that man could ever get. The gift of God. The gift of his son the god of all creation born as a man i was watching a video yesterday that showed every you know the smallest things that man knows of and the largest thing that man knows of compared to man and the video starts with man in the center and if you go to the left as you zoom to the left you go to the smallest insects and smallest uh organisms right until viruses and um right down to Planck's constant which is one times ten to the minus something it is so small okay and God was responsible for making that little thing so intricate and then from that he made up made everything until men and when we go and we scroll to the right we go on to Jupiter which is a thousand three hundred times the size of Earth and then you go on to the sun, which is probably a million times the, the size of Earth. And you keep going and you go to into the galaxy, which is 90, which is probably 130 million miles or so wide. And then you keep going and you go to planets and heavenly bodies that are so big, so big that compared to them, Earth is microscopic and it still carries on because that's all we know about. That's all we know. And when you consider that, the, that the God who made all that, you've got to understand how great he is. You cannot comprehend it. These big numbers are just numbers. You cannot comprehend it. But some earth compared to some of those planets is like one grain of sand on all the seashores of earth. That's how it is. That's how it is. And we are so insignificant compared to those great planets and heavenly bodies that God fashioned by his word. 
And of all those things, this God who made it, imagine how great he, he, he must be, incomprehensible, beyond the understanding of man, beyond, beyond the understanding of the greatest supercomputers. But he decided to make man in his own image. And not only that, he loved us. He gave us his love. And this God decided to come to earth as a baby, born in a manger, in a stable, and give his life for us. Something that's so insignificant. Yet God did it for us. What a significant gift this is. It is the most amazing gift that man could get. And this is the God that says, Behold, I stand at your door and I knock. So why was Jesus born in a stable? Why wasn't he born in the palaces? I mean, there were great palaces in those days. Herod had built good palaces. The pharaohs had good palaces. The, the, the Rajas in, or the Maharajas or Rajas in India had great palaces. And the, there were many, many great places. Why was Jesus born in a stable? We've got to consider that today. Why? And why was Jesus born to simple peasant parents? His parents were peasants. They were not rich. Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, father, Joseph, was a carpenter. He was a young carpenter. And they were born, he, and Jesus was from Nazareth. His parents were simple people. Why didn't God go for the rich kings? Why didn't he go for the rulers of the synagogue? I mean, surely they were holy people. They were noble people. Why did God choose to be born to, to a simple peasant girl, Mary? Why did he choose to have his son come into the world in a stable? You see, Jesus didn't come only for one part of the world. He didn't come for the rich. If Jesus was born to a rich man, then he would be the rich man's God. And the poor would not even worry about him. But Jesus came for the poor. He came for the needy. He came for those who were suffering, those who had no access to medical care, those who had no access to good water, those who lived in squalid conditions. He came for the sinners. He came for the drunkards. He came for the prostitutes. He came for those who were drunkards. You see, those that sick need a physician. Those that are well don't need a physician. But that is not everything. Jesus came for everybody, but he decided to come in the lowliest so that no one will be excluded. Jesus is like fresh air. It's available to everybody. It's available to everybody. Even the poorest has access to fresh air. And that is why Jesus came to be born of the simplest of parents. They had nothing of their own. At that time, Joseph was still preparing a room in his father's house for his wife to be. And Jesus was born. We don't even know what they had when they went to, uh, to, to go and register themselves. We don't know if they had a donkey. We don't know if uh, Mary walked all the way. But they ended up in this town. And Mary's time was due. Mary was about to give birth. And Joseph went looking for a place where he could rest and where his wife could give birth to the king of kings. He didn't know it was the king of kings. He knew there was something special and that was it. And guess what? Nobody, no, none of the inns had space for Jesus. To every inn that Joseph went, he asked the innkeeper and the innkeeper said, no, we have no room. We have no room. And these people who refused Joseph's room did not realize that they were refusing a room for the, to the king of kings. They were refusing a room to the God who made the minutest until the, the biggest, 
the God of all creation, the God who is not, who does not live in time, who lives in eternity, who lives in the eternal present, and they didn't understand who was knocking at their door. They just looked at Joseph and they said, yes, another person, yes, his wife is pregnant, but we are too busy making money right now and we are full and it's time to close the doors. It's time to close the doors. And, and the doors were closed in Joseph's face. But in reality, the doors of their hearts were closed to Jesus. And then Joseph goes on and eventually he finds an inn. And there the innkeeper also says he has no place. But what he can do, here was a man who had some compassion. A man whose house was full, but he decided, let me allow them to sleep in the stable. And he said to Joseph, we don't have room in the home, in the, in the inn. There's no space. Even the veranda is full. But what I can do, I can allow you to sleep with the animals. Sleep with the animals. And he gave him the stable. And that is how Jesus ended up in a stable. But God himself knew that that is where his son was going to be born. He knew that. He knew that in fact God wanted that. Because God sent his son to the lowly. God sent his son to be a pastor. The original pastor of this world. He lived in a pastor, pastoral. He was born in a pastoral setting. And Jesus was born in the stable because there was no room for Jesus in the inn. Today the question you have to ask, where is Jesus in my life? My inn, this inn is representative of your life today. You are the innkeeper. God cannot force himself. Joseph could not force himself into any of those inns. He couldn't ask the innkeeper to kick somebody out so that he could get a room. He couldn't ask the innkeeper to sleep on the floor and allow him to use his bedroom. No, the innkeeper had to do it himself. And today you're the innkeeper and Jesus has come knocking. Jesus wants to be born in your heart today. And you've got to, you've got to think about it. You've got to voluntarily open up the door. You've got to allow Jesus into your heart. And I'll come back to the question at the end. And then we consider that Jesus, while he was being born or after he was born, an angel appeared to shepherds. Again, the Lord chose the mundane things of the world to confound the wise. God chose shepherds who were looking after their sheep at night. And an angel appeared to them. And what a fright they might have got to see an angel. They were looking out for wolves and bears or whatever else, coyotes or whatever was going to destroy the sheep and even maybe, uh, you know, uh, poachers or whoever's going to steal the sheep. But all of a sudden, a light shone around them and a bright, a bright light and an angel stood in front of them. An angel stood in front of them. And whenever an angel appeared in the, in the Old Testament, there was a message. Whenever an angel appeared, there was a message. An angel appeared to, to Mary. An angel appeared to, to other people in the Bible. Go and read the Old Testament. You see so many places. In the New Testament as well, an angel appeared. And every time an angel appeared, there was a message. An angel appeared to Daniel with a message. And here the angel appears to shepherds. Herod was the one who was waiting for the message. But God sent the message to the shepherds. Remember, Herod was looking for this king. Because the wise men had come through and said, we've seen a star that is following this king. We've seen a star that is following this king. And we, we have followed it to your city or your district. Jesus, or God sent the angel to tell the shepherds that the Savior was born. To tell the shepherds that the great shepherd was now born. The great shepherd has come into the world. Throughout the New Testament, you'll find the scene. It's always a pastoral scene. And that's where we get the word pastor from. Pasture, looking after sheep, a shepherd and his sheep. And these shepherds knew 
what it was to look after sheep, what it was to give their lives for sheep or risk their lives for the sheep. And here the angels comes to tell them, yes, you are good shepherds, but the good shepherd in capital letters, the good shepherd has just been born. The good shepherd, not of sheep, but the good shepherd of man has been born. And God chose those shepherds to take the news. And those were his first missionaries. Because the shepherds rushed into town to find the baby and tell everybody that the good shepherd has been born. And the angel said, I bring you good tidings. Good news. I bring you good news. Good news of great joy. What is this good news? The good news is that the Savior of the world has been born. And he is Christ the Lord. He's not a normal human being. He's Christ. He is the Messiah. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Lord, meaning he is God. God has been born. Maybe the shepherds didn't get the, the full gist of the, of the, of the angel's words. I, I probably think, I, I think they probably did not. They maybe didn't understand it. But what they understood, that somebody great was born. They knew that a Savior has been born. They knew that the Savior has been born. They could understand that this was good news. And there was great joy. And this great joy was not the fact that like Judas thought that Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman Empire and take over, uh, take over the, 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 uh, uh, the Jewish lands again, take over Israel and, and, uh, and Judah. This was the good news that Jesus was going to come to unseat Satan. Jesus was going to unseat Satan. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan fell from his throne. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan's face hit the dust. And Jesus rescued us from the clutches of Satan. He rescued us from the chains of Satan. The chains fell off our hands. We were no more slaves. The most amazing gift we could get, the gift of God, the gift who is God, and the total freedom and salvation in this God, life in this God, life in Jesus was given. That is the great joy that we celebrate. That is why we celebrate Christmas. That is why we celebrate Christmas. That is why I celebrate Christmas. Not because I remember that Jesus was born, but because I remember Jesus was born to save. He wasn't just born. He was born to be the savior of the earth, the Christ, the Lord. And that's the great news. And then we remember the star, the star that followed Jesus. The wise men who came from the east, we do not know where in the east. It might have been as far as China, it might have been as far as India. We do not know where they came from, but they were eastern kings. And when you look at Chinese and Indian history, you know that thousands, four or five thousand years ago, they already were astronomers they were looking at the stars there were astrologers in those places and when they saw this star this new star this new star this bright star they realized that this star wasn't staying still it wasn't in a constant orbit like other stars this star was following someone this star was moving towards someone this star was attracted by something some being, some force, somebody, and they follow it. And they decided that they were going to follow this moving star and see where it took them. And by their calculations and by their reasoning, which I suppose was far ahead of what even some of us know now, without all the instruments we have, they came to the conclusion, probably through the Spirit of God, that they were following the star of a king. They were following a star which was following the king and they followed the star. If a star could follow Jesus, something that has, has no speech, something that has no will, if that could follow Jesus, how come we fail to follow Jesus? How come we fail to follow Jesus? The star recognized 
The star recognized that the king of kings was born and the star followed him. The star worshipped him. The star glorified him. And these wise men, these kings they were, they knew, they knew that the greatest human being, the God man was being born and they, even though they might have worshipped other gods, they might have even worshipped the stars, they knew they had to follow and they followed. And they brought Jesus three gifts. They brought him three gifts. They brought him gold. Gold, which was the most expensive, most precious metal they could have, they could find in those days. And this was to signify that a king was born. And then they brought him frankincense. Frankincense was, which was an incense that was used in worship. And they came to worship this king because they knew that the high priest was born. The true high priest was born. And then they brought him myrrh. Now myrrh is a bitter herb. Myrrh is a perfume that they use or a herb they use when they embalm a body. And that was a foretelling that this king, this high priest was going to die and his body was going to be embalmed. So they foretold the death of Jesus. And that is the greatest gift today. That is the greatest gift that this God, this high priest, this super being, this creator of everything came and he died. He died for us. The great news that the Savior, the Christ is born, but born to die for you and me, born to save us. And today, as I close, we have to ask ourselves this question. In my home, in your home, there are many rooms. In your heart, there are many rooms. In our homes, we have a room where we cook. It's called the kitchen. We have a room where we bathe, so the bathroom. We have a room where we we sit around and la and lounge. It's called our lounge or our sitting room, our living room. We got a bedroom. We've got a garage where we park our cars. We have a room where we watch TV. It's called our TV room, TV lounge, whatever it is. We've got a room for everything. And in our hearts, we have room for many things. We have a room that is designated for work, for our career, for our business for our love, loved ones, for our wife or spouse, for our children, for our hobbies, for even like me, I have a room for Manchester United. You know, I love my team, my soccer team. We have a room where we watch TV. In my heart, I have a room for, for lots of things. But the question, the pertinent question today is the gift of Jesus is at your door. He is knocking at your door. Do you have room for Jesus? Do you have room for Jesus? Are you going to invite him in and say, Lord, come. Here's my bedroom. You lay down here. Here's my lounge. Sit down here. I'll go to the kitchen. I will make you something to eat. Let me wash your feet, Lord Jesus. Are you going to say, I'm so sorry, Lord. I don't have place, but I do have a, 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 a garage or a shed out there. Maybe you want to sit out there and then I'll come and see you when I have time. How many of us do that to Jesus? We have a little shed out in our lives, in our heart. We have a small place out there. And when we finished watching our soccer, we finished playing with the kids. We finished all our chores. We've, at the end of the day, when we come back from work or whenever, then we need Jesus. Oh, you know, wait, there's Jesus. Let me just go and check in on him. And you go there and you spend five minutes and come back. Or are you like the other innkeepers who didn't even have that for Jesus? And I'll bet most of you, most of you today are like the innkeeper in the story. You're busy with your life. It's a busy season. You don't have room in the main part of your house but you're a christian and you need you know you need to have jesus in your life so you gave him a small room on the side he's there 
When I need you, I will see you. You say to Jesus, don't call me, I'll call you. Ask yourself, have you any room for Jesus? And if you have room for Jesus, which room do you give to Jesus? And which room do you use for yourself? Jesus is asking you to give him a place in your heart where he can rule, where he can reign, where he can live, where he can be with you every minute of the day. Have you any room for Jesus? I trust you have enjoyed God's word and that it has been a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. All messages can be found on our YouTube channel, Riverside Tabernacle. I urge you to visit and just subscribe. It'll help me if you subscribe. It'll keep us going. Remember, we are live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sundays at 10 a.m. This is Pastor Simon, and as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless you.